Okay. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure for Nowcast SA to host this District 2 candidate forum today with uh, 10 of the 12 candidates running for the position. The other two candidates were invited but did not complete the required AV check. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege now. Don't tell the other city council districts, but D2 is my favorite. I live here and I vote here in every single election. 26 years ago, my husband and I bought a home in Minky Park neighborhood. We loved it despite the fact that the ceilings had fallen in from a leaky roof. There were huge cracks in the walls of every room. There was no toilet or sink in the second bathroom. The exterior wood desperately needed paint and nearly all the windows in the garage were broken and needed replacing. A handful of window panes had holes that appeared to have come from gunshots. And that's just what we could see. We loved it and we could afford it, which was important. Believe me, we didn't get into journalism for the money. So D2 is up close and personal, but not just to me. The questions we have been asked to deliver represent the hopes and frustrations of many of our neighbors. I recognize many of the same questions that have been posed on the dozens of candidate forums that Nowcast SA has webcast or recorded in the past 11 years. So this time I'm taking a cue from my dear friends at COPS Metro Alliance, and we're gonna incorporate some accountability into this process. I'm going to be asking you candidates for measurable specifics. And whoever is elected, we're gonna come find you in six months and report on how well you kept your promises. And now Cast SA and my neighbors are going to keep that promise. Here's how it will go today. We're gonna to start out with a two minute opening statement and then go to questions. I will be asking the questions in a randomized order so you won't be following the same person every time. Because we have mapped this out to last until 4.30, we will take a halftime break and watch some fabulous drone footage of District 2 for about 10 minutes so we can get up and stretch or take a bio break. Um, I'm working with about a dozen questions that came in from the community, but we will be keeping a lookout for live questions that pave new ground. Candidates, please remain muted when you're not speaking. Candidates may not address questions by or make remarks to the other candidates. All the questions come from me, the moderator. We do have a mute button and we will use it if you run over your time for more than just to finish the sentence you're working on. And now for opening statements, each candidate will have two minutes and I'm going to start out in, in ballot order. Um, so the first person answering this question will be Nika Cleaver. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here. I'm so excited to be running for District 2 Council. A lot of work that um, I've, I've been doing for the last 10 years and a lot of my life, actually, because I see myself as a servant to the community. I've been working my butt off for the last uh, 10 years here in District 2, providing resources for people and solving issues that they have. I don't have any special interest. My interest is the people. So whatever your issue is, is my issue and I work with my community partners to get them solved. I've worked with the mayor, the city manager, our council members, our judicial system, the DA, our police officers, and I keep great relationships with them so we can solve community problems. That's what it's all about. I have a passion for this, uh, for this district and for this city. I am very knowledgeable about how the city is ran and what District 2 needs to move forward so we can all be united and be successful within this city. So I'm just excited and, I, and I am, I'm coming at it with more than 100% to give you more than my 100% of energy, time, talents, and connections so we can be the great district that we want to be. It's up to us to do the things that we want to do for us. And I'm here to lead the way. I'm here to do the things that I've been doing and add to that to continue to do the things that, need, that District 2 needs. Um, I just, as, as much, I just want to really, really, really just share with you my passion for the community. And that passion is going to leak over into the office, into the job that we need done within the council and within the dais, communicating with other council members and showing them how making District 2 great will make the rest of San Antonio great. I ask for your vote, your support, and I promise you, I will bring you results. Okay, and the next candidate is Walter Perry Sr. 
Yes, good afternoon. My name is Walter Perry, and I am running for District 2 City Council. And the reason I'm running is simple. I want to take the district in another direction. Over the last few years, we haven't had a solid plan. We've just been winging it. And ever since Ivy Taylor, we've lost direction on what the, what the district uh, is supposed to do and where it's supposed to go. And so for me, I'm a business graduate from Texas A&M San Antonio. And one of the things I want to do is take this district in a business approach. I want to take this uh, this growth that we're having right now with the housing. Uh, I want to combine the private and the public sector dollars with the investment for commercial. And I also want to help a lot of these small businesses that are in District 2. Our small businesses have been getting neglected over these big corporations. When it comes to city procurements, they're giving them to these big corporations and not the smaller corporations uh, and not the smaller businesses. And it's been having an effect on the way that these businesses can operate. And I want to be a champion for those small businesses. I'm going to be a champion for those small businesses. I have the Perry Plan. The Perry Plan is an infrastructure plan for the people. And what it is, it stands on pillars of health and wellness. Our people have to get better. We have to be in the right frame of mind and our hearts need to be in the right place. We need to get housing reform. We need to get residential home repair for our people here. We need roof repair. We need foundation repair. These people need repair, period, from the inside out. So we need to get money in their pockets. We need to get the train. We need to get workforce development. And we need to get all in with this Economic Development Foundation's uh, all-in essay plan, which is going to bring 140,000 new jobs, 200,000 more degrees and certifications, and $8 billion in salaries and wages. And we have to find a way to develop our people in District 2 to be ready for these 140,000 jobs. I don't want to see this, this boom happen. And this district is not in place to take advantage of this. So I want your vote. My name is Walter Perry, and I'll see you on April 19th. Okay, next candidate is, um, is she here yet? Uh, Jada Andrew Sullivan. Okay, next candidate is Pharaoh Clark. Thank you. My name is my name is Farrell Clark, and the reason that I'm running for District Two is because anybody who knows District Two or is even familiar with District Two knows that for years we've had the same problems. We've seen the same problems as council come and go. These problems are not resolved. The reason for that is because we continue to pick the same council people based off personal relations, based off friendships, based off who is more charismatic or who engages with people more when reality is we should be looking at people with proven results. Out of the candidates, I am the candidate who has a proven track record in working in the city, county, and the state level and getting the results that the district has called for. And I have successfully worked on every single level to deliver results. Within a year's time, we have done a lot. We put an end to no-knock warrants, chokeholds. We've also worked with the plan to uh, workforce development that created 40,000 or that's creating $40,000, uh, 40,000 jobs along with stipends. We also work with the DA's office to create a civil rights investigation division. We've done a lot of work. We have advocated at Congress in, in Austin. We have fought at con uh, commissioner's court here in San Antonio. We also fight in city council on a regular basis to bring forth the community uh, needs. We need relentless people in office that are going to fight for the changes that are needed in our community. We need people that don't just talk about plans, but actually live those plans out every single day and that are committed to the district with 24 hour representation. District two has severely been underrepresented for a long time, and it's time that we put an end to that. If you elect me as your district two representative, I promise to you that I will remain accessible. I will remain accountable and I will always deliver action. Thank you. And the next candidate is Christy Villanueva. I think Christy, our timing is just about impeccable. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me. Hello everyone. My name is Christy Villanueva, former president of the West San Antonio Chamber. I was also recently a trustee with the board of VIA. Uh, appointed to that board, Board of Ethics also, which was an appointment. I also serve on other boards throughout the city. My passion is obviously has been uh, displayed through all of the development, all of the small business support that I have given throughout the community, also for transportation and others. 
my desire to serve really comes from the fact that this is how I was brought up. It's important to me to help my community do better. There is nothing behind um, no money or no people. There is no one pushing me to do this but myself. I feel a duty to serve, and which is why I decided to move from the chamber over into an elected office. My focus is truly to be able to represent the district at a higher level in because as we all know, District 2 is extremely diverse. And in addition to its diversity, it has been left behind in a number of different categories. We've got to rebuild. We have to move forward. We have to bring more money into our area and no longer leave our neighbors behind. And this is what I'm here for. And this is why I ask for your vote to elect me as your next councilwoman. It's important that we unite and move forward together. Thank you. Okay, um, very quickly, Dory, make sure that you download um, the uh, virtual background because um, we can't put you up without the, um, with, the, with campaign literature. The next person to speak, the next candidate to speak is Norris Tyrone Darden. Good afternoon, my name is Norris Tyrone Darden and I'm a candidate for city council district two. So for me, I've been active civically since I've returned home from college since 2003. And there's three things that I look for in a candidate when I'm trying to cast an informed vote. That's experience, education, and of course, energy. So for me, being a lifelong resident, a native son of District 2, I've had the opportunity to gather those references uh, throughout our community over decades. And so I understand in our diversity, in the, in the size of our district, there's a lot of different things that you need to bring to the table. For me, I'm an educator. I've been educating our district for 18 years, Davis Middle School, Sam Houston High School, and now at George Gervin Academy. And I understand that education is our vehicle out of poverty, it's our vehicle into success, and it's the way we sustain all of our growth. In regards to our experience and our education, in order to be effective in our district, we have to be able to communicate. I believe that we've had a lot of concerns over the past years in our district office because there's been a lack of communication on, on certain levels. We need to make sure we show up that whoever's in that office. And then finally, the energy. We have to be innovative. We have to be able to step out the box and we have to be able to work with people. I believe I have all those qualities. Those are my strengths and I will bring that to the district. With that being said, District 2 is the best district in the city. And we need to work hard to ensure that everybody else knows that. And that's gonna be my goal. Norris Tyrone Darden, City Council District Two candidate. And always remember, if you call Tyrone, help will be on the way. Thank you. Thank you. And the next uh, candidate up is Chris Dawkins. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And uh, that was great, Tyrone. Uh, I really like that. Um, my name is Chris Dawkins, and uh, help is on the way. The um, I respectfully ask for your vote for me for uh, District 2. I'm the eighth position on the ballot, but I want to be the number one person you think about when you cast your vote. Why? Because I'm the senior person in the race. I'm the senior citizen. I'm the oldest person. And why should that matter to you? Because in District 2, we've had some challenges. Uh, at the council level. We've tried the young candidates uh, in the past and they've shown inexperience, immaturity, which has led to ineffective leadership and sometimes downright embarrassment. Uh, we've had some great candidates, but um, I think that we can really do better now. As for myself, I have served as the past president of Lakeside Neighborhood Association. And that's another thing that I bring to the race that none of the other candidates have had, uh, which is being the president of a neighborhood association, which I think is very important and I think should be the litmus test as we choose candidates going forward. Um, I have that experience. I was also uh, on the Joint Commission for Elderly Affairs, uh, which uh, was a commission for elderly people in the uh, city of San Antonio. Uh, both on the county level and on the city level. Uh, three years ago, I had to give up that seat for District 2 
we have not had a senior representative uh, in that uh, position. Prior to that, prior to me being nominated, uh, it was eight years and we did not have somebody to represent the seniors uh, for District 2. So that's what I talk about when I say irresponsibility, and I hope that you will elect Chris Dawkins when it comes time to vote. Thank you. Thank you. And the next candidate is Dory Brown. Dory. Well, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. I'm not at home where I had set up for this meeting. I'm actually still in my car, but out um, greeting the people block walking on today. Um, once again, my name is Dory Brown, and I just want to um, take this moment to let you all know. One of the reasons that I'm running for city council is I believe we need a positive, proactive change of somebody who does stuff in the community while relating to the people and listening to the people. Um, that is one of the things that I've done. I've done stuff in the background for over 14 years. And so um, I haven't been out there trying to be in the be seen by everybody when those people who know me know that they can call on me. I'm going to get the job done. I'm working hard and that I have um, the follow through and I'm going to stand up for what's right. One thing you'll know about me is I'm sincere. I'm honest. My integrity is true. I will always be there as a business owner and having my business in district two. I saw things that lacked within the within district two, even particularly more the east side when it comes to being able to for a business owner to find a place to have a professional office. Um, and also just to, to encourage and uplift, uplift other people and other small business owners as well. As a homeowner in this district, I was not raised on the east side. Um, I was not raised in district two. So when I built my house, it was a choice, a choice that I made to invest my hard earned money within this district. And I've been here, um, with no regrets ever since, um, 95. Have I been in this district? Even when I purchased a new home, I stayed within District 2, within East Central School District because I saw the benefits of it. I believe that um, District 2, um, it needs a lot of love. There's a lot of fight that needs to happen. Um, I feel that I we're taking out. granted and I will work hard. OK, thank you. And I'm working on this background. <laughs> OK, and the next candidate is Carl Booker. I do not see Carl. Okay. Um, so we will be going to Jalen McKee Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Jalen McKee Rodriguez, and I'm a 26 year old high school math teacher at Madison High School and the son of two veterans. I moved to San Antonio almost eight years ago to attend UTSA, where I got my BA in communication and where I'll be graduating this summer with my master's in educational leadership and policy studies. Many know that as teachers, we're the first line of defense for so many students. I've had students tell me when they were being abused at home, and I've had to make too many of those CPS calls. Teachers notice when students are wearing the same outfit for a week, and we take care of that when families can't. Students of mine have come to class the day after one of their parents was killed, and they don't know how to process that trauma, so they continue as though everything is normal. And as a teacher, I have to add. Teaching is heavy, heavy work, and I've been at that point where I feel helpless. I have to work in the confines of the system, and I'm not that kind of person. So for a while, I've helped candidates get elected because I believe in them and their vision. But like many voters, I've been disappointed in dishonest leadership. So now I've had people come to me and encourage me to run for office because they believe in me and what I want for my students' futures. In addition to my experience as a teacher, I've previously served as District 2's Director of Communication and also a board member of Stonewall Democrats and as a member of Texas Organizing Project, San Antonio DSA, and our Revolution. I've also served as a volunteer with GSD Youth, Child Advocate San Antonio, and City Year. Through these experiences, I know the impact the influence of our city of our council members can have on my students and their families and our neighbors. I know what home repairs, rent forgiveness, and extended eviction moratorium, citywide broadband, broadband, a knowledgeable zoning commissioner, quality jobs. I know what difference these things can make. I'm disappointed that our city council has not delivered, but I remain optimistic that it's not too late to change. That's why I'm running for district. 
Thank, Thank you. you. And now we are going to go back to uh, Jada Andrew Sullivan, who has. We need to unmute her. Let me text her. Um, Jada, we're still not able to hear you at all, um, and um, the mute button is not changing on. Uh, maybe you need to change your audio source on your computer uh, to uh, the audio source being apparently built-in computer at this point, or built-in microphone at this point. Um, and if you can't find it immediately, we may, um, yeah, talk. Can you hear me? Yes, go. Awesome. We had to play with it a little bit, but hey, that's technology and we get through it, right? That's what we've been doing in the last year. So again, I'm City Councilwoman Jane Andrew Sullivan representing District Clock, 2. Clock, please reset. And I am so thankful to be here. So I'm going to get through this because we know that we have many questions that are here. But we are here to make consistency happen. Consistency matters. We have seen the revolving door of what it looks like when we have to continue to start over, start over, start over, and we get nothing done in our community. I wanna thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to be here. We've been out, we've been knocking on doors, we've been listening to the community, and we hear the cries of what is continuously needing to be done. Even though we have been putting several things in place and getting several things done, we know that there is still more work to do right here in District 2. District 2 is over almost 60 square miles wide. That's a lot of work to be done. We have started to see the wheels of momentum change as we're bringing in economic development, making sure that we are keeping families within their homes. We have been able to save 44,000 families here in the district area through our emergency housing and assistance program. And even though that's just a mile mark of what we can do when we work together, we are so happy to see that we continue to have our families in place. And even though we know that this is our only first term, the second term holds a lot more. The pandemic put a stop to a lot of things that we had in progress, but please understand that we are still going forward. We're doing the work of the people. The people here in District 2 are the people who have raised us, made us, and keep us strong. They keep us accountable. They hold us to our word. And even when we do have times of crisis, we build, we grow, and we unite. We are here to continue to educate, empower, and uplift District 2. Thank you once again for continuing to believe in the dream, and our dream is continuing to happen as we speak right now. So thank you for your time, and we look forward to continuously serving District 2. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, just to reiterate real quickly, um, we're going to be going through these questions from here on uh, until halftime. We will have... Uh, You'll have uh, um, one minute or less to answer the questions. Clock, go down to one. Um, and we're going to start out the first question. Um, okay, and then I will ask in a different order um, than the last time. Okay, so the first question is, as a city council person, one of your responsibilities is to appoint people to boards and commission including the Zoning Commission and the Historic Design and Review Commission, where I've spent lots of hours. D2 has within its boundaries six historic districts and numerous designated landmarks, which makes these positions very, very critical. And in the past, sometimes people who have filled those positions have either not lived in District 2, not had the expertise, or sometimes not even lived in the city. If you are elected, will you pledge to fill these seats with people who reside in the district and who have expertise and a passion for listening and learning? And the first person to answer this will be Christy Villanueva. 
Thank you. Uh, one minute, is that correct? One minute, yes. And it's Christy, yes. not Jalen. Christy. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, but we also see Jalen. That's okay. I oh. got it. Oh, okay. All right. So thank you. So as a person who has already served on several boards and commissions, I understand the necessity to have qualified people participate in the conversations. We need to make sure there are experts. I am committed to making sure or there are residents that do step up. And if I cannot, if I do not receive applications from residents, I will go out and look for them myself. I think it's extremely important. I know the difficulty that I had just to get the positions that I did on those boards. I went around to all the council members because I was not able to get a response four years ago and then three years ago again to serve my community. So I wanna assure everyone that you will have the dedication needed to all boards and commissions. And I will also include persons with disabilities and persons of all ages. Thank you. Thank you, time. And the next person uh, on this question is Dory Brown. Can we unmute Dory? I unmuted. Okay, sorry about that. I've been trying to get this virtual thing while I'm in the car. But anyway, um, most definitely, there is no reason at all why there should be somebody outside of our district serving on the boards in our favor. I want to make sure somebody who has a vested interest in this district, who looks out for this district, is is put in that position. And there are too many people within the district. If you if you reach out within the community, even if you don't particularly know that person, there's enough people in the district, even within our senior saints, even within people that we know have been community activists who know somebody that you can connect with um, that can fill that seat. So even if somebody doesn't apply to it, there's a number of resources and that gives you a chance to know who's out in your in your district and you don't have to look for just that one position that one time you know put it time. out there within all the <laughs> thank you okay and the next person on this question is miss nika cleaver so this is my favorite topic because i know that the boards and commissions is what really runs our city and district two has been absolutely misrepresented now we heard just a couple of days ago that all of the boards and commission seats have been filled but i find that really hard because i've had many many countless people try to apply for boards and commissions couldn't find an application didn't get a call back couldn't get connected. Not only have we already put together a list of boards and commissions that D2 is able to be a part of, within the first 30 days, we will go back and interview through all of those positions to make sure that the person sitting there loves District 2, knows District 2, knows the, the, the opportunities of the district and is very knowledgeable about what they are representing. If they do not have our best interest at hand, they will not sit in that seat. And within the first 30 days, we will make sure of it. Thank you. Um, and um, the next person for this question is Pharaoh Clark. Yes, I would, can you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, I would definitely work to ensure that not only that the boards and commissions are being properly uh, filled, but I would also make sure that diversity and equity was being uh, looked at when those positions are being filled to make sure that it accurately represents the district. You have 30 seconds. Left. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, not only not only on the boards and commissions, but also through the office, it's important that you don't just go with um, just go with people who apply. You also have to make sure that you do like uh, I think it was Ms. Dory Brown said um, and go out and seek the experts. You have to go out and look for people that are qualified and make sure that the very best is serving the community. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take a brief moment here, Carl. I see you have joined us. Carl, you should have in your um, uh, email a virtual background to download. Um, if you can do that, um, fine. Um, hey, let me try and find it. I guess give me okay. three or yeah, four. Keep, keep doing it. We're going to on, on to other people on the questions, okay? The next person for this question is Chris Dawkins. Thank you so much for the question. Um, first of all, uh, when you talk about historic preservation, I was named a fellow by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, DC. So I am very versed on um, historical value, number one. Second, if I am elected, uh, the first people that I'm gonna look to be able to fill all of these slots is, although I told you I am a senior, uh, the other candidates that are here, I would look to them to also ask them to continue to serve and to find a way for them to serve. And hopefully they will want to serve on some of those boards and commissions. Uh, number three, I have served on the uh, Joint Commission for Elderly Affairs. And again, that has not been filled for three years. And I'm hoping that that's one of the first things that I can do because I hear from that uh, board or uh, chairperson all of the time. So. I'm very much in tune to what you're talking about, and I will be receptive. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Norris Tyrone Darden. He's waiting for my face to pop up. There I go. Okay, so so thank you. Um, so to answer your question, yes. I want to make sure I answer the question, but I think the bigger thing is how. And so for me, District 2, again, is the best district in the entire city. With that being said, we're the most talented district in the entire city. But if we're not reaching out to people, we'll never know. How we do that, though? Coalition building. Work with our nonprofits, working with our HOAs and NAs, working with our social groups, and working with our faith-based community, and getting all these people together and having a literal talent search having a summit to identify those people in our community who are experts in these different fields and who want to be a part of these processes and have the level of commitment that we need to move our district forward. And so, yes to the question, how coalition building and working with those stakeholders in our community. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. So this is a huge part of my platform and it falls under protecting the integrity of neighborhoods. Um, the people mentioned in the question, these are folk who are not following neighborhood plans, not respecting the will of the neighborhoods and are focused on their profits rather than respecting the will of our communities. And they're making deals in private. So my commitment is that I will establish a community driven appointment process for the HDRC and zoning board, um, as well as other boards and commissions. And for these specifically, we're going to prioritize those who are knowledgeable and have ties to the community. And there are many community leaders who are qualified and more than willing to serve. And one huge problem is that developers are contributing to the campaign to our city council and are then placed on boards and commissions. It's a terrible pay to, pay to play system. And I'm proud to have been the first candidate to commit to taking zero developer dollars. And I have proven that campaigns do not need them to run. And our council members do not need to be beholden to developers. I'm a people driven candidate and you can count on me to be honest about that. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Jada Andrews Sullivan. Thank you so much. That was one of the first things that we were able to do when we came into office. We put out the call to action to our community and our community stepped up. So first and foremost, I wanna thank those who volunteer their time to give back to their community. I wanna thank those who volunteer to step up into the boards and commissions. I wanna be thankful to all of those who are continuing to serve to speak for our community. I wanna thank those who did say that we needed to see a difference in HDRC and in our planning of our uh, operational development of how we place people on our boards and commissions. And even though we have been able to truly fill all of our seats, we know that we continue to thank each and every person that decided to step up and say, let me help with the voice and amplifying the voice of our district. So thank you to all of our boards and commission appointees, and we look forward to your continued service here to the District 2 area. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And the next person on this question is Walter Perry. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I do commit to appointing people on the boards and commissions. And as a matter of fact, one of the first things I'm going to do is go through the list and see who's been termed too long. There's been people that's been on these boards and commissions for a long time. I looked on the on the website and I've seen people that's supposed to be on there for one or two years. They've been on there for five or six years. So we got to get these old people off of there because they, they have old ideas and they're not coming with fresh ideas. So that's one of the first things I'm going to do is, you know, do a scrubbing. But I want to point at one place, which is the zoning, because that has been a big concern of mine. Because if you go on MLK, you look at those houses, those houses don't have back doors. And that is not only a fire hazard, that is just unnecessary. And that's a zoning issue. And that's why I feel like we have to get leadership in there who's going to put the right zoning people in there who can have oversight on these construction projects. It's a shame that it's looking like that on MLK. Thank you. And the next person on that question, Carl, I know you were with us a minute ago. You still with us? Yes. I'm still, okay. I'm still here. I'm still here. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on this in, in particular. Um, for, for several years, I worked with uh, architect Norsell Haywood. We were part of a strategy for some of the green belts in the district currently. Um, many, many, many of individuals that I have met over the years is through my relationship with Norsell Haywood. So uh, working with him and working with the community, I'm, I'm definitely aware of uh, some of the boards that need to be filled but i mean whether it's ters board or or historical you know one of the things that i that i have uh, in my plan is to have some of my uh, uh some of my discretionary funds used towards um you know uh, historic preservation and also having the right individual that know about the history and I'm, I'm particularly aware of what's going on in the history so you know fulfilling those positions is high priority stuff wasn't getting done it's time to get them done Thank you. I'm going to um, repeat something real quick before we go to the next question. Um, from from what I said earlier, um, part of what we're trying to do, because I have a lot of these questions are questions that we addressed in 2019 and 2017 and, and on and on. Um, I'm going to be asking questions um, that include an accountability quote. Uh, function so that you can say, this is what I'm going to do in like the first six months. And we're going to come back and say uh, to the person who wins this election, how well have you done? So commission, remember, we're going to be coming back in six months to check up on you on this question. And um, the first person to answer um, in this round for question number two is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. For sure. So I think one of the biggest struggles that our city has in filling these areas and one of the biggest oversights is in outreach. Um, so it's thinking about how are we reaching people to fill these boards? How are we letting people know that these seats are vacant and putting someone there who's knowledgeable and qualified? And there are, like, as you've said, there are plenty of seniors who would love to serve. So one of the biggest investments I will make will be an outreach um, that will not just be online because we know that there is a huge digital divide in the city. Um, this will include mail, this will include physical canvassing to reach senior centers, to reach um, seniors who live throughout the district. Um, it's not hard to find, so it's just about getting on the course and doing a lot of the same things that we're learning as candidates, we, can, we should continue doing when elected. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Ms. Nika Cleaver. So I was so surprised to hear that there were so many seniors that didn't have a voice. Being that every election and every time someone's asking for a vote, they're always concentrating on the seniors. So how do we go from concentrating on the seniors during election time and then not talking to them for two years and then we're right back concentrating on the seniors? This has to be a daily thing that we're dealing with, which a lot of other things in our community, which is why I'll have committees that are specific to each of those things. So we will have a senior committee with people who are leaders and already work with our seniors in our district to make sure that their voice is heard, to make sure that they have resources, again, which is something that we already do, and to make sure that they are accessible to whatever the things are doing. We're gonna use our community centers for that because there is a digital divide and there are a lot of seniors that don't want to even learn about technology. So we still need to get to them. But at the end of the day, 
they are important and we're gonna and they're part of the entire district so we'll keep their voice heard throughout Time. the two years thank you <laughs> and the next person on this question is uh tyrone darden yes ma'am thank you so going back to that last question the response I want to harp on is the how. And so, yes, we know this is a need and we have to get it done, but the how. It goes back to coalition building. We know in District 2, our seniors are the force when it comes to civic engagement. But beyond that, outside of those, you know, three or 4,000, four to 5,000 seniors that are voting, we also have a, a mass number of seniors that want to be involved. We have to look at the agencies and the entities that are already connected to these critical mass of people. And so who are that? Our faith-based community, our nonprofit community, even our health and wellness community. They're already attached to our seniors. So we have to make sure the district office is coalition building with these entities to make sure we have that connectivity and that pipeline to these critical mass of people. We have to work smart, not hard. And again, be innovative and bring some of those new ideas to the table. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Walter Perry. Uh, yes, I would definitely uh, have someone, one of my seniors, uh, representing for the seniors. As a matter of fact, there's a guy by the name of Dan Martinez. He's a he's been an active senior in our district for a long time. He would be somebody I would reach out to. He's over in Delcrest. Uh, also, I will go through my voters' roll and my uh, in my homestead list and get the list of my seniors so I can do wellness checks on there. Um, here's the thing about it is, I want a senior center just like the one they have in District 10 that Councilman Perry has for his seniors. I want to roll out the red carpet for our seniors because they, they are the ones who laid down the groundwork for us to be here. So I talk to a lot of seniors. You can go uh, next door. You'll see me talking to the seniors all the time. Um, I'm, I'm the honorary protector of the seniors in my uh, neighborhood over here on of F Street in New Heights. So I'm committed to these seniors and I'm committed to giving them a voice but I'm also committed to protecting them and fighting for them because they're not always able to fight. So you have a champion out of me. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Chris Dawkins. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm the last person who served on that, on that board. Um, I think this is a very important question and something that all of the candidates uh, that have talked thus far have said, we have a constituent constituency of seniors already, why aren't they being uh, taken care of and represented? That means me, I'm one of those seniors. I'm one of those people who are not being represented. So you can be assured that I will make sure that they are represented. Uh, I also want to make sure that uh, they are spending close to a half a million dollars for the senior center on WW White Road for 17,000 square feet of space, which is ridiculous. And they don't even own the building. So like Walter just talked about, he wants one, we're going to build one and invest in one to make sure that we're not spending all of that money on something that doesn't belong to the city. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. So when you were asking about this, this commission, I mean, it is very upsetting that this seat would remain vacant because there's absolutely no reason. I'm sure as many of the other candidates and just like myself, as we go out and talk to people in the community, we can see that our seniors are not represented. They are happy to share that information and this needs to stop. We need to be able to capture their voice and represent them as we move forward. So I would absolutely be looking for a person who has a diverse background as a senior, who wants to represent the entire district, and then who's gonna continuously give feedback to me directly and to the staff member also assigned to just that level of, of uh, engagement with seniors to make sure that we're making some better strides. The other thing that I found out Your that time we don't is up. do, thank you. And um, the next person on this question is Carl Booker. Yes, without a doubt, this will be filled. Uh, I wanna say within 30 days, again, if you're familiar with our, our product, the Black Book, we work with um, you know, seniors, uh, in particular historians, 
uh, for documentation for District 2 in the city of San Antonio. Uh, how we fulfill that is, is really is, is having a passionate uh, individuals that is committed to uh, working with the dist District 2 and its legacy. Uh, filling that position will not be difficult. Um, I've worked with, and again, over 1,400 businesses in the community. Uh, along with that are you know some senior citizens that do have business or are retired. I am familiar with the, the community and the individuals that help uh, build what it is today. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Pharaoh Clark. Okay, I'm glad you asked this question because I believe seniors are very important, not only to myself, but also to the district. So I would absolutely work to ensure that we fill that uh, seat with the person that's most qualified. But in, uh, also, I would also add to that by making sure that we form the committee of seniors throughout the district that wanted to get involved and be engaged in um, the governance of, of the affairs of our senior citizens. I think that another area that we're lacking in that I would feel we would have a major investment in closing the digital divide. A lot of times we speak to how our seniors don't have access to a lot of things because of the fact they're not on Facebook, on Instagram, or you know, social medias, or, or even on computers, technology. I think we have to invest in closing that divide and in providing them with the resources they need because the better equipped they are, the more productive lives that they can live and it will give those that don't have a voice, a voice and access to resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Dory Brown. Um, yes, one of the things that um, when it comes to this commission or any commission, if you're worried about the senior commission, if you don't know where to start, we can start with our very own Chris Dawkins. So when I win, Chris, <laughs> um, knowing that he has a qualification and experience and has a passion and will look out for um, the seniors, um, he's a great place to start. You know, I'm not a senior, but I do represent the AARP group. So I definitely want to have somebody in there who is looking out, you know, for those in that transition. Now, there's a lot of seniors who have retired who don't want to do anything, but they still want their voice heard. So we have to be mindful of them that they still matter. One of the things I tried to get MLK Commission to do was like have a job fair within the commission. So people who wanted to work and volunteer with the MLK Commission could, never could get them to do that. So with any other of these other commissions, that was something I will um, establish to kind of basically kind of have a job there when it comes to the MLK, the commission, so people know what's out there. Thank, Thank you. you. And the next person on this question is Jada Andrew Sullivan. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank our seniors, especially Mrs. Mitchell, who reached out to us about senior shredding services and the, the lack of access that they have to truly protect their identities. Then I want to thank AARP Mills on Wheels for continuing to do the work that they continue to do with our senior services. Also, what we have seen, especially with a lot of the homebound seniors, is that we have been able to use our San Antonio Fire Department MIH team to deliver home vaccines to those who are homebound. And not only for our seniors, but those within our disabled community as well. As we continue to talk about it, Mr. Dawkins, we know that stepping off of the board was something you didn't want to do, but having your voice to continue to represent those seniors is what we are always look forward to. Meeting with the, the commission for our seniors, we spoke to the things that they needed to see, which is telemed, telehealth, and making sure that someone understood that they are here as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now on to the next question, which is going to be a short question. Um, uh, and we're going to give you 30 seconds to respond to this one. Okay, clock, time clock, you need to go down to 30 seconds. Time clock is one of my favorite people. Okay, all right. The the um, the question is: uh, District Two is a large district, has many diverse neighborhoods. How many neighborhood association, community association meetings do you plan to attend virtually, but not by sending a staffer in your first six months of office? This is a quickie. 30 seconds, how many meetings? And the first person on this one is Carl Booker. Like a lot of things, scheduling. As long as it's scheduled, I'll be there. Um, 
communication is half the battle. So as long as we're aware of the meeting, I will personally be there. If it's in person, I'll be there. If it's virtually, I'll be there. So it's just a matter of scheduling. I, I don't have a problem. Um, you know, I would like to do 100%. How about that? Okay. And the next person is Farrell Clark. Uh, I'd literally be at as many of them as I can attend. Anybody who follows me or is familiar with the work I do, you know that I attend literally hundreds of meetings, city council, commissioner's court, uh, Zooms, uh, attending uh, Congress to speak on house bills. So I'm very, very active when it comes to that. And there's not a day goes by that I'm not in at least three to three or six Zooms. So I'd attend as many as possible. Thank you. The next person on this question is Chris Dawkins. Uh, One hundred percent. I will do all of them. There are going to be some neighborhoods. Wow. Hold on. Are you hearing me? That's there we go. Now we got Chris uh, time time clock. Would you start over again, please, at 30? So I'm going to attend 100 percent of them. Uh, I'm going to both attend in person. I'm going to set them up with uh, Zoom so that they understand and can do Zoom. We're going to also continue the president's roundtable. We're going to do that. Those people or those areas that do not have neighborhood associations, we're going to help them to create those. This is a cornerstone of what I believe and how you make the city council work because those constituents are what makes it go. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Dory Brown. My goal would be to attend 100%, but no less than 60% um, within the first month and then get the other 40% in the second month. That's the perfect opp opportune time to introduce yourself um as the council person to find out what the concerns are and then make sure you put all that together if you can do 100 percent the first month when you come back in the second then you can kind of give follow-up on what they you've discussed previously thank you time um and the next person is uh norris tyrone darden yes ma'am so my goal in the first six months is to attend 100 percent of the meetings either via Zoom or if they're having them in person, safely uh, in person. Beyond that, we also have to look at, over this uh, pandemic, the homeowner association and neighborhood associations that have literally folded. Uh, in block walking in East Terror Hills, they've told me we need help because we really don't have that level of support anymore and we aren't meeting. And so that would be a priority, 100% and help those who need the help the most. Thank you. The next person on this is uh, Nika Cleaver. All right, so we have, do I unmute myself? I'm sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you, you're fine. Okay, fabulous, okay. So we have 29 neighborhood associations in District 2. Many of them meet on a Tuesday or a Monday at six o'clock. I know this because I sit on the board of Denver Heights Neighborhood Association and Dignity Neighborhood Association happens at the same time. I will be at 100%. We just got to get the timing together to make sure that I can get to all of them. This is very important because they are part of the plan to make District 2 great. They have to have more involvement and more support. So I'll be there. Thank you. And next is Jada Andrew Sullivan. Thank you so much. So um, we are continuing to work with the Neighborhood Association Presidents Roundtable with over 32 different Neighborhood Association Presidents. We continue to know that we have lost two of our neighborhood association presidents here within Eastwood Village and also their general Kruger. So we send our heartfelt condolences to those. But we will continue to register those neighborhood associations within the areas that need to have their bylaws put in place. And we thank you so much for your work. And the next person is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. For sure. So I want to start off by saying that because I've seen city council schedules, I've seen um, the, what those meetings look like, and I see the schedules for every neighborhood association, I know it's not realistic to say I will attend every meeting, and I won't disappoint anybody by promising that. But I will commit to attending one of the first two neighborhood association meetings, um, because there are some that are done quarterly, so you need to prioritize those when there are conflicts with multiple neighborhood associations. But I do believe it is a priority to attend every and include um, 
those neighborhood leaders that are not officially recognized because there's plenty of those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next person on this is Walter Perry. Uh, yes, I will commit to going to as many as possible. Initially, I will make as many because I'm new to the job. So I want to introduce myself. But one of the ideas that I have, I want to create a neighborhood association hub where it's uh, where they can come and make copies, have meetings, and everybody can come as a coalition building like they do with the Eastern Triangle. It's like 12 neighborhood associations and they're one neighborhood association and they come together. So I want to make that that old, uh, I want to make that connection right there with the city services and the neighborhood associations. Time. The next person on this question is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. So I know that uh, a council person schedule is very vast and it's going to take a lot of time to go to all these neighborhood association meetings and other organizations, but I will commit to being in as many as possible. Zoom is a beautiful thing. And if I will be allowed to do that and join the groups that way, that will help and add to the schedule because we need to have that connection and I wanna make sure that it takes place. I'll be there, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, according to, um, uh, oh no, I've got, I've got another question, sorry. I've got another question before we do our, before we do our halftime. Um, and um, let me make sure I get this question in for Susan. Um, this next question will be a one minute question. Um, and the, um, sticking it in for Susan here, boom, there we go. Um, this question is, uh, some of you mentioned this um, um, in the last question, but there are a lot of community associations, not necessarily recognized by the city. Um, and there are a lot of other groups out there that um, represent constituencies, geographic constituencies in the, in the community. So the question is, how will you ensure that neighborhood associations, community associations, and the voices of residents are all part of the decision-making process? Remember, for this, I need some specific measurable steps that you're going to take so that we can come back and say, did you do it And in your first six months? Um, the first person on this question is going to be Farrell Clark. Yes, I think that... I'm sorry, I think that's very important and uh, it's already part of the work that I already do. Having to sit on uh, so many different organizations and be a part of so many different committees, it is, it's an absolutely important question to be able to make sure that everybody's involved and having to be in, you know, uh, in touch with so many people, but it is definitely possible. One of the things we have to do is bring in technology to ensure that happens, to make sure that people have every possible way to get in touch with their um, their council members via text, whether it's emails, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you have to open all lines of communication and ensure that everybody possible has a seat at that table. And that's something that I will continue to do. I will engage our faith-based communities, our nonprofits, and our organizations that are recognized and unrecognized in order to get that done. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person on this question is Norris Tyrone Darden. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. And so for District 2, we have a lot of great independent and individual organizations operating what I like to call their silos of excellence. And those silos are excellent in, in name because they help the people that are a part of it. But when we want to start growing and we want to start sustaining that growth, we have to break down those walls. And that goes back to my statement of coalition building and working together. And so we know in District 2, faith-based community, nonprofit community, our social groups, all those are the organizations, the neighborhood association, homeowner associations, or the organizations that are attached to the critical masses. But we need to start working together. And so for me, coalition building will be the number one priority in addition to constituency services. We get more people involved, we get more people connected, and more voices will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on this question is Walter Perry. Yes, again, like I said, uh, the biggest thing for these neighborhood associations is having the access to the, council's, uh, to the council office. So I promise to create more accessibility for the neighborhood associations. I said earlier, I want to create hubs 
for the neighborhood associations to where they can all come together. See, you need to create a place to where they can all come together. And then that way you can, you can talk to them. They can have meeting spaces. They can come get city data. They can come run off copies. They can uh, create neighborhood association welcome packages for new people who move into their neighborhoods. See, those are the type of things that uh, we need to do. Like we need to strengthen our neighborhood associations. So imagine if my neighborhood, Wheatley Heights, we had a welcome to the neighborhood package that talked about trash pickup days, the mail pickup days, who your neighbors are, who to call, situations like that. We need our neighborhood associations to be active like that because they have information to residents that the city doesn't. And once we start utilizing those type of things for us, we can be successful. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Carl Booker. Yes, I have a plan for a community dashboard. In that dashboard, it's about documentation. So if a neighborhood association has any issues, whether it's stray dogs, speed bumps, homeless uh, encampments, they need to be established. They need to be uh, what I call created a standard. So if we know in a particular neighborhood that they have a standard of stray dogs or you know, speeding throughout the neighborhood, we need to identify that establish milestones for that neighborhood, find out how we can fix it. Uh, again, we will have a FAQ in that community dashboard that addresses their issue. So if it's in writing, we wanna respond in writing and then have um, a timeline of when we're gonna get that done. So if we believe we can solve that problem, we're gonna document it and let them know that it's in progress, uh, almost like a Uber, it's on its way and we're gonna fix it. Thank you. The next person on this is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. For sure. So my commitments are one, I will attend neighborhood association meetings and will have at least one staff member at every one of those meetings. Two, I will establish a process that places these organizations meetings on the books. So I'm aware of all of them and I or a staff member can maintain constant communication with these leaders. Three, I will establish an advisory board that will serve to make policy, budgeting, commission and board placements and community engagement recommendations. Um, and all can serve on that board, all are eligible. Um, and I think four, I will also have Friday office hours at each of the two field offices so that I am accessible to everyone on the East and the Northeast. Thank you. We have time left. The synced. <laughs> okay. Um, the next person on this question is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. The, the focus of this would be to have success is definitely to be accessible. So I would make sure that I am accessible and all of the staff members are constantly accessible to each of these groups, no matter what they're doing, no matter what activity is going on. We want to make sure that we're always checking in, we're always documenting the progress overall, and then we're sharing that with the rest of the community. So that is definitely going to be the key to this. We also, my team and I want to build strategy meetings to make sure that each of the questions are getting answered. And if they're not being addressed, we can take care of that very quickly. So bringing everyone together, uniting the community from all areas throughout District 2. Thank you. Okay. And the next person on this question is Dory Brown. And yes, can you repeat the question for me? Because I got distracted sure by a child. One second. Um, how will you ensure that neighborhood associations, community associations, and the voices of residents are all part of the decision making, making process? And I am looking for specific measurable steps. Okay. Um, one of the things we have to do is see what's out there and revamp and rethink what's out there. I know um, like the city has an app. I don't see how why we can't, um, expand off of that unless we need to create our own um, even through our website when i worked for um, state rep ruth jones mcclendon we had a separate website um, for the residents to get information out that was that did not go through the state so we, even if we do use that as an avenue for them to contact us that make sure everything is time stamped and dated in a way that we can make sure we follow up and give the people a way to contact us not just pass me a walmart and say a few words to me and expect me to remember your situation but we will um make sure or i will make sure that the residents issues are noted 
uh, addressed and followed up on. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Nika Cleaver. So I'm going to say uh, the relationships that I already have, the relationships that we will build, communication, and having a center core place for engagement. It's all about like right now I've talked to so many special interest groups and community groups and people who work and serve the community. Why? Because my name is on a list and I'm running for a candidate. They can find me. So that's what they'll need to be able to do as council person. Yes, we will have a committee within the office that strictly deals with neighborhood associations and groups that want to build and work for the district. So that way they have consistent help, consistent resources, and a consistent cheerleader to help you get to the issues that you need done. We don't have to wait on a certain date. We also have ilovemyd2.com that will launch, that will have questions, surveys, and places for you to put your concerns in. And yes, I will be accessible at all times, whether it's through the office, through the phone, through the email, or through this website. We're going to get it done. Okay. And the next person on this question is Jada Andrews Sullivan. Thank you so much. So we continue to have open access. Um, even in the last year when our office was closed and the city was shut down, we continue to answer questions on Facebook. We continue to have access through making sure that you have your e-blast, working with CCESA, working with COPS Metro. We continue to have a monthly meeting that is set up. So we continue to reach out to our faith-based leaders by having a quarterly meeting with our faith-based ministers to make sure that they are able to get that communication back out to their parishioners. We continue to work with the ICANN. We continue to work with our schools and our school counselors. We continue to work on making sure that our constituents can come in and speak to us at the office. Last campaign, we gave out my personal phone number. And in the last two years, it still hasn't changed. So we are still accessible. We're still here to do the work for our community. We will continue to work with each and every person that is willing and able and wanting to work with us. We are here for you, District 2. Know that your answers will be given to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Chris Dawkins. Okay. Uh, first of all, news alert. Um, if I become the council person, the neighborhood roundtable is going to be called now the Community Congress. The Community Congress is going to be a group of uh, neighborhood organizations, and it's a two-way street. I want them to be able to contact me, and I want to be able to contact them. I want to empower them so that the neighbors in their neighborhood are using the neighborhood organizations. I want to try to structure this in such a way where the neighborhood organizations have a lot of power to make sure that the neighbors get involved. The problem that I see right now and being a neighborhood president before is that uh, People just don't get in touch or go through their neighborhood organizations. And I want to try to make that uh, so that it does happen more, that we've got more input from the neighbors to the neighborhood association to the council district. Whatever we need to do as far as that's concerned, I'm willing to do how we're going to make that uh, accountable or numbered or quantified. I don't know how we're going to do that. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have come up to, uh, in our um, run of show, to the point where everybody, including me, needs to stand up and stretch. Um, but we have some really terrific, um, absolutely wonderful um, videos for you from, the, from District 2. We're going to have some drone video footage um, of District 2 playing for about the next 10 minutes. Um, um, and we will get back on track in... I'm sorry, uh, Adam, is it eight and a half minutes? Um, I think eight and a half minutes. So that would be um, about uh, 3.24 that we will be back online, which is almost in line with our um, wonderful run of show. What, what's up with that? Um, and I also want to thank um, the absolutely terrific and wonderful people um, from the um, translation services who are here and who have been so, so fabulous about keeping up with all of you guys and making sure that, that we are um, accessible uh, to, to everybody, to an even bigger, bigger audience um, today. And um, uh, also to a couple of really very important donors. Um, um, uh, we got, uh, uh, 
uh, Liz Franklin and Dee Smith um, uh, donated, uh, your neighbors donated um, to support this, this broadcast, as did the chairman of the board of Nowcast SA, um, Chuck Andrews, um, Charles Andrews Jr. Um, and we also have a really important uh, media partner, Local Community News, who's helping us um, um, helping us get this word out and also um, documenting it and um, sharing it with their community, which um, also includes um, parts of the of District 2, including my neighborhood. Um, and um, I think that's everybody until I, um, until I get nudged about who I forgot. So Adam, you ready? Um, we'll take it away with some great drone footage. You there? Okay. Okay, let's let's do the drones so we can all take Thank you. 
Okay, welcome back. Weren't those some lovely, lovely videos? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to um, your neighbors who suggested that that would be a great way to do halftime. And let me uh, call them out by name. Um, uh, Ivana Flores is uh, tucked over my shoulder there. It's SAI interpreters, and they are, they are the best. Totally wonderful, and I'm so grateful for their help today. Um, that really made this possible. And another um, uh, another shout out to the folks at Ken's Five. Um, everyone uh, on on the east side of San Antonio in District 2 um, knows um, Ken's Five's most beloved um, uh, resident of District 2 is Sue Kalberg. And Ken's Five um, also um, did, some, did a story of, and um, promotion of this event today. And so the next time you see a Ken's Five person say, thanks guys, because they care. Okay, um, we're up on question number five now. Um, and let me tuck this into Crowdcast for, for um, so that it can be linked. Um, by the way, in case you are not aware, if you go back to Crowdcast after this, you can, um, you can click on the questions and when that question is asked, it will jump the video straight to that question. So you can hear all the candidates responses to those specific questions, to that specific question, which is one of the reasons we love Crowdcast. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, District 2 uh, seems to be ground zero for gentrification and development. And often that leaves longtime low-income residents vulnerable and displaced. What specific steps are you going to take to help, help them deal with that? And um, for this, we're on question number five. The first person to answer this is Walter Perry. In the Perry plan, we specifically are going to build and make homeowners. I think that is the key to stopping gentrification, is to raise the level of home ownership. When you have people in those homes, developers can't get them. And the reason that they were able to come in during the promise zone was because we had a lot of vacant lots and a lot of dilapidated <clears throat> and vacant homes. So they were able to come to these neighborhoods, spruce up these houses with this cheap stuff, this cheap labor and this cheap, these cheap uh, building materials and charge astronomical prices for neighborhoods that's not really working. We have in these neighborhoods that are gentrified, we still have prostitution, you still have crime, you still have blight and there's still food deserts. So one of the things I would do is create a straight path to home ownership. That is the true way to stopping crime and gentrification. And you can look at the numbers and it will show you, you have a stronger home ownership neighborhood, you have a stronger community, stronger schools, and you have better businesses so that's why I will go is building home ownership. Okay, and we're just gonna hang tight for just a second here. And I'm going to um, repeat the question for you guys. Um, uh, again, District 2 seems to be ground zero for gentrification and development. It can leave long time, low income residents vulnerable and displaced. What specific steps will you have to, um, to help them? Will you take to help those people? Okay, and the next person on this question is uh, Jada Andrews Sullivan. Um, thank you so much. So what we have started to do is we are looking at what development is truly coming into the district. We have denied many zonings that have been asked to be built. We also have changed the UDC to make sure that any development that is coming into the district is consistent with the identity of those neighborhoods. Also making sure that we are putting in development that speaks to community partners that really wanna to help to uplift the district to area. By looking at those other homes that are in the same areas that they're looking to develop to say, what can we do to beautify the neighborhoods and beautify the homes that are right there? We do not want to displace families. So we need to make sure that we are working with our state representatives and working with our tax assessors to make sure that we are having equitable appraisals done within our community. We have seen the, the District 2 area be overpriced by 250% just in the local areas. So that is the work that we will continue to do. We will continue to hold everyone accountable, but we will get in the resources that our community needs. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I was muted there. Um, and the next person on this question is Pharaoh Clark.
Pharaoh, I think you are muted. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, oh, now I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I muted me. Clock. Oh. Clock, can you reset? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that I would work really heavy to do, and I believe they've already had success with this in the county, is I would work to create a tax freeze or various tax breaks for residents of uh, D2 that are homeowners. I believe creating a tax freeze for them will allow building economic will allow the building and economic development in the area to take place while at the same time ensuring that our most vulnerable citizens, which are our seniors and even our disabled residents and our families, are not displaced from their properties. We also would like to make sure that there's incentives for developers that want to come in and build responsibly and not damage our neighborhoods and take away or create gentrification. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. My pen. Hmm. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, just a, a tiny bit of musical chairs going on here. Let's hang in there. <laughs> and we've got, okay, we've got Jalen back. Um, and we've got me back. And now all we need is um, Ivana back and um, the clock and um, Ivana. There we go. We're all here. Okay. Do you remember the question or shall I repeat it? Yes. Yes. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. We're Thank good. you. So I'm going to continue my commitment to taking no developer dollars. I can and will work with developers without taking their money. Um, and I'll be open and honest with community leaders when it's time to make zoning changes. And I believe it's the office's responsibility to compromise in a way that leans toward neighborhood goals and neighborhood plans first. Um, also, tangible item, I will propose either through a budget amendment or a CCR to include a tax freeze for areas affected by new development and renovations on their streets. Um, we also need to have a look at what affordability really is in D2 and step two, work with HUD to change the AMI because it conflicts with the reality of what the AMI is in San Antonio, specifically in D2. Um, and we have these you know, high rise luxury apartments that they want to build and they'll say, we can fit teachers, two teachers and their family in this unit, and it's going to be affordable for them. But two teachers and their family are not going to move into a one bedroom luxury apartment. And that is what we have been allowing to happen in District 2, and it cannot happen anymore. Thank you. Time. And um, for everybody, everyone who does not know off the top of their head what is an AMI, that is adjustable median, uh, average median income. And it is that that is part of what's used to determine affordability of of houses um in a broad sense so um sometimes and in san antonio that is broadly used in the county um average uh, uh median income which is a, a a higher figure than in san antonio anyway um off of uh off of the uh, glossary there and the next person to answer this question is going to be carl booker yes gentrification is definitely a problem but understand if you're a senior citizen, uh, you, you have tax incentives or tax breaks. If you're a disabled vet, you have tax breaks. But in, in addition to that, I think when it comes to gentrification, it's really about um, legacy or um, keeping it in the family, so to speak. So if we have any type of opportunities to make sure that uh, individuals uh, that want to stay in their family home have the ability to stay in their family home. Uh, also, in addition to that, uh, that there are uh, opportunities for improvement. So uh, hypothetical, if there are uh, areas in the homes that need to be upgraded or fixed, that there will be some incentives that allows someone to come in there either um, retrofit uh, for um, handicap, but also um, cosmetic uh, facade improvement. So I'm, I'm definitely in favor of, of doing that to better the community and enhance the, the area as well. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Dory Brown. Okay, I'm still on the phone. I'll be <laughs> on the Zoom in a minute. But um, when it comes to this, can you hear me okay? Um, one of the, I guess, concerns, issues, or whatever is, is that, um, you know, we've had people that have been in these homes for a long time, and they may not know the true 
responsibility of home ownership and really what it takes to, to take care of a home because you probably have generations in there who's always just depended on um, mom or dad or grandma to do this. So one of the things we have to do is make sure we bring it to the people of what we can do to help them to upgrade their homes, take care of their homes, let them know the resources that are out there and make it understandable and feasible for them. Also not allow these developers, uh, as we, if we can stop them that don't already have permission, but to come in and build things that are gonna compete and drive up the tax rate as well. Thank you. Try and to be timely, okay. Thank you. <laughs> then the next person on this question is Christy. In the waiver. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so one of the biggest things that I continue to learn from our legacy homeowners is that they do not feel supported. They do feel that there is new development coming in and around them. So I am definitely pledging to support to make sure each of them has the necessary education that's needed and the necessary resources to get back on track. I don't want any more of those family members and individuals to be losing their homes because many of them have said they have parents that recently passed away and they wanna to continue to stay in the neighborhood. The other thing is we have to work with those developers and make sure that they understand that we want developers that will work with small businesses and not take advantage of our neighbors. So there will be incentives there for them to stop doing that. Thank you. Okay, and the next person on this question is Nika Cleaver. So I didn't really hear the whole question because my computer I, died. I, I can, I can, oh, that's why you were briefly missing and coming back, okay. Yes. The clock, the clock will remain at one minute while I repeat the question. And, okay. Because we are, um, because technology. <laughs> um, the question is, District 2 seems to be ground zero for gentrification and development, and that leaves can leave longtime low-income residents vulnerable and often displaced. Mm -hmm. What specific steps would you take to help them? Okay. So from the answers, that's what I thought the question would be. But we do have to actually educate all of our residents on what tax breaks that they can get and they already are um, able to get, right? Then we also have to be proactive and help our residents get to the place to where they can live comfortably in their homes and they have the resources needed to live a comfortable life. The other thing we have to do is definitely work with developers. There's a lot of developers out there that understand affordable housing and want to bring stuff to our community. So working with them um, and giving them tax breaks or different breaks to make sure that they are, you know, working with our community instead of against it. But we also have to understand that bringing new things to our community does is going to be a raise in taxes. So instead of stopping it, it's preparing our people to be able to handle that and still be able to live in the area that they love. Thank you. Um, and the next person on this question is Chris Dawkins. This is a real difficult question because there's a lot packed into it. Number one, uh, gentrification is real. Uh, from the bond issue, if I were elected, uh, I would make sure that number one, there would be money in there where people can fix up their homes. I think that's the first important thing. People need to fix up their homes. The homes that are built in San Antonio, the majority of the stock uh, was built in like in 1951. Some of it does need to go. So in a funnel, so to speak, as we deal with this whole issue, I don't want people to just cry gentrification because they didn't do anything with their property. So uh, some property does need to be raised. I am in agreement with that. But those people who are in their property and want to do something to their homes, we want to give them the tools that they need to be able to take care of that. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Hopefully there'll be some questions on uh, affordable housing and we can talk about some other issues later. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this is uh, Norris Tyrone Darden. Yes, ma'am. So listen, the gentrification train is on the track and it's moving full steam ahead. And as a community, we have three options. We can try to figure out how to drive that train. We can figure out a seat on that train 
or we can continue to let the train drag us. That's not what we want for our community because it goes back to your question. People being displaced and being vulnerable. So a key thing as an educator, we know knowledge is power. And so providing the community with the knowledge they need to be prepared when these things come about. What do I mean by these things? Higher taxes, um, situations where they can't afford to make these improvements and stay in their homes. Beyond that though, as a district office, we can't micromanage these things. So from a macro level, we have to empower people in the community. Again, coalition building, faith-based community, nonprofits, all the different entities and empower them, homeowner association, neighborhood association, and empower them to pass this information on and continue to circle back to make sure everybody's needs are being met. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I think that ends the round for this, this question. Um, the next question, and uh, this also, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very global question. Um, um, homelessness, big problem throughout San Antonio and in District 2. Give me three specific examples of things you will do to address this problem in the first six months on the job. I didn't say solve it, but three specific things that you will do to address this problem in your first six months in office. And, and the first person on tap is Chris Dawkins. Wow. Uh, the first three things that I would probably do is number one, I want to talk and, and find out what's going on at uh, Haven for Hope. Uh, we may have just seen in the news where the executive director is stepping down from there. Um, I also, there's a place in, uh, I think, Sioux City, Iowa, that has a homeless shelter, which a gentleman told me about yesterday. I want to look at that, find out uh, what's going on there and, and what we can learn from them, uh, what they are doing. And then the third thing is that I want to be able to talk to experts everywhere, within the city, outside the city, and I want to build uh, using Haven for Hope as our model and then build upon that. Thank you. Next person on this question is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. This is a really tough question to answer, but I know first and foremost, I would make sure to speak with the law enforcement and social workers to see what it is that they're experiencing as they're coming in contact with our homeless residents. Make sure that there is not something that we can't immediately activate and expand on to help the situation. The next thing is there are a lot of nonprofits that have been supporting our homeless residents. So I wanna make sure to also figure out how we can expand on their services and make sure that they're not just sleeping in tents or sleeping out on the streets and then other residents of District 2 are just living in fear as they've expressed. We want to be able to come together. And the third is to make sure to keep this all going, to make sure that we have money in the budget to do these things, to expand, to help others so we don't lose the validity and, and the forward moving progress. Thank you. Thank you. Next person on this question is Nika Cleaver. All right, so we've, we've got to first figure out where the city stands in the programs that they want to do. They do have money for homeless. They do have a plan, uh, different getting different motels, hotels, different situations, buildings that haven't been used to try to help with that. So we got to see what they have in store so we can either fill gaps or help with that, uh, with those programs to move forward. Uh, another thing that we have to do is uh, work with or see where all of like, like, um, Ah, um, excuse me, all of our shelters and, and places that already deal with the homeless and see where we can help and actually support those things. The city has really taken away our faith based uh, community that really, really helps with the homeless. So I feel like we need to support the faith based community to make sure that uh, they have the resources and things that they need. And then thirdly, we have to start with the plan. Can we deal? Can we work with developers to create a place with with programs um, that can help with homeless and get out of that situation? Because we want to prevent time. homelessness. Time. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Jada Andrews Sullivan. Well, we continue to work with coalitions like Housing First Coalition. We continue to build 
models like the model that we have coming into district two with the tiny homes in the town twin village that is a permanent supportive housing program that will have also community-based resources a health clinic um, amphitheater and entertainment and we will be dedicating that to those who are 65 and above living in chronic homelessness and then also to work with other organizations such as the hope house who helps our homeless find jobs and help them find a source of becoming and finding themselves again. And then we continue to work with our outreach programs. We continue to work on the outreach and homeless initiative and strategic plan that the city of San Antonio has already put in place by looking at other green space areas and buying these different uh, resources such as in vacant hotels and vacant warehouses. These are the things that are already in place. We have to build on those things that are in place and make sure that we are using these federal dollars that we have come in to truly speak to this. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Walter Perry. Uh, yes, thank you. One of the first things I want to do is take the human approach. I want to find their relatives. I want to see if they have family, next of kin, somebody who can come and help them. Because a lot of times, a lot of these people, they have family, but they're detached from their family. And that's why they wind up on the streets because they have issues with their family. So let's try to find the next kin. Once we do that, we want to connect them to resources, whether that's a shelter, whether that's uh, mental health services, whatever that may be, we want to connect them to the resources. And we also want to follow up after a period of time, six months, two years, uh, a year or so, because we want to see if uh, the, the resources we're providing and the help that we're giving them is having any type of progress on them. We want to look out for the youth, the formerly incarcerated and the LGBTQI, because those are the populations that are really homeless and they don't have the services and the support that they need. So I'm going to dedicate my office as an office of support for these people so that way they can have a champion for homelessness. Thank you. Uh, the next person on this question is Farrell Clark. Thank you. So uh, my belief is that we have to start with addressing the root cause. And there's going to be three main root causes that we have to look at. That is creating uh, creating space for free mental health counseling, free drug abuse counseling, and free family counseling. If you don't address and attack the root cause of homelessness, it does not matter what area and how you try to fix it, you will continuously see a revolving door. If we address these different key areas, and first we work through those, uh, through our nonprofits, our faith base, um, and even our, our schools to send their undergraduates to help us with counseling. And once we address the problems on that level, then we can move on to making sure that we're connecting them with resources and jobs and providing wraparound services and support that help foster their independence. Thank you. The next person on this question is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. Yes, so my priority will be housing first policy. If the priority is houselessness, the focus needs to be on housing. Housing first prioritizes getting people off the streets and in um, shelter and have, getting them access to mental health services. So one, I'll propose the purchase of two vacant hotels and temporarily house the, so the homeless, similarly to in Austin. Um, a huge problem with Haven for Hope is they require people to give up their heads, give up their belongings, and give up their coping me mechanisms, all of which are no deals for a lot of people. Two, we have to commit to mental health care in all city-owned housing facilities. Um, the causes of, hope, of uh, homelessness are trauma, mental health care, um, and that's why we have so many veterans, so many LGBTQ teenagers who have PTSD. Um, these are communities that are high in crime as well um, and have an opportunity gap. Three, um, increase the amount of time caseworkers have to provide recommendations when they're visiting house, houseless encampments. Um, that's a big one. Um, and then there's also four extra support tiny housing communities for permanent housing solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person on this question is Norris Tyrone Darden. Yes, ma'am. So the first thing we need to understand is that homelessness and houselessness is not, they are not monoliths. So the first thing we have to figure out is or identify are the different levels of homelessness. There's not one type of homelessness. And so if we try to approach it all the same way, we're going to fail dramatically. The next thing that we definitely need to do is once we identify the different levels of homelessness, then we look at those root causes for each level. For example, someone may be homeless because they're one paycheck away and they, they lost that the job and now they're homeless. So now their root cause is they need 
a living wage job or a paying job. We connect them to those resources. And then finally, the community comes together. We identify the people that have a heart for this, that are the experts for this, and we put together a team that puts together a draft for a comprehensive housing program that leads and is transitional and it leads to home ownership if that's what the person desires. Everyone does not desire to be a homeowner. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on this question is Dory Brown. Okay, can you hear Dory, me? Dory, okay? you did it. Yes, okay. <laughs> Adjust it. Um, when it comes to homelessness, one, I want to work with, um, I don't believe in recreating the will. So I want to get with the organizations that are out there already, such as like Haven for Hope and Sam and other faith-based ministries, and see how we can help them. Or they can tell us what the shortcomings are, um, the reason maybe what they thought they could do, they couldn't do, and how we can fill those gaps in the holes. Um, Manage the tent cities. The tent cities are out there. You can't just move the people around. But if we can kind of assist them, you know, and managing them and keeping them clean, you know, that's something we can do. Um, I agree with Pharaoh. We have to find the root cause of why people are out there. And then sometimes you have to realize some people, they just prefer to be homeless. You know, so some people don't believe that. But I've talked to homeless people before that that say that. And I just talked to a lady today who has a concern about homeless people living next to her house. And she said, yeah, they told her they just want to be homeless. They don't want the responsibility of time. You know, that responsibility to be at home. Thank you. Okay. And the next person to speak on this question is Carl Booker. Again, part of my community dashboard is to have, um, you know, access to information. One thing that's important to the community is inventory. We need to know where the vacant lots are, where the vacant buildings are, where the vacant schools are. This will allow not only uh, us as individuals to be able to send someone there, but also for developers that are looking for real estate opportunities that will allow for housing. Uh, secondly, this is a mental health issue. Imagine being homeless. It's going to be stressful. So we, we, we know these things going in like a moth to a flame. It will be an attraction. So if we know a horse needs water. We're going to build a pond to attract that horse. Same thing with the, the homelessness. If they're in need of help, if we have a destination where they know they can get help and not be judged, we want to develop that with our current inventory. And that's what is going to be required through our community dashboards, through standards, milestones, and timelines. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, well, yeah, we're, we've gone from um, complicated questions to profound questions, right? And um, and the next question is another one of those things that I have heard asked so many times, and um, and so I and I know you've all thought deeply about it. Um, everyone who lives in in San Antonio has thought about this. You guys have thought deeply about it, and so I really want some specifics on what you've thought about where you would go. We all agree it's it's a problem, but what have you thought about what you would do? What are your first steps in your first six months of office? And here's the question. The East Side is struggling for help with all of the violence. What can you do to slow down the shooting? What is your vision for addressing the violence on the East Side and for rebuilding the community? Remember, I want some specifics that you will take in your first six months of office. And we're gonna start on this with Norris Tyrone Darden. So I believe that everything is relative. Yes, we do have a uh, violent crime issue on the east side and we are concerned, but I don't want to ever make people feel like this is the part of the, of the community, this is the part of our city where all the crime is happening. That's just totally not true. What I will say is this though, there needs to be more opportunities for our youth and our young people. And so we need to make a better investment in them. I understand we want skate rings and malls and all things like that, but we can't have them instantaneously. But what can we have? What can, what can we have? We can have opportunities that are connected to workforce development. We can have opportunities that are, that are connected to the trade and vocational um, areas. We have to start putting our people in a place to where they have a choice. And so with that being said, 
as a council person, the initial piece would be identifying all the resources and connecting all the community members to those resources so we can have a choice. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person to speak on this is Chris Dawkins. Um, help is on the way. Uh, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to be very hard on crime. Uh, it's going to be so difficult that uh, some folks may not uh, really like it. We're going to attack the address and we're going to empower those neighborhoods where that home is. Because you cannot really stop crime without people being involved. So the first thing is that they've got to say that they want crime to be out of their neighborhood. We're going to allow, uh, ask those people who are doing renting, that they're going to have to have background checks on the people who they rent to. And we're going to allow the neighborhood associations to take the person at that address, if they're found in a, 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 to be a problem, to take them to JP court. And if they win in JP court, that money is going to go to the neighborhood. Uh, I've talked to McManus about this and then DA Nico LaHood about this. And most of the time where crime occurs is where there is no neighborhood organization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person on this question is Christy Villanueva. So specifics to addressing this and in the beginning, we know that we have a world of resources through the city. We know that we have a listing of all the 311 and 911 calls that we have access to. So we need to identify what exactly is happening. I personally have lived through this. The second thing is I'm going to make sure that the residents are not given the runaround anymore. This has specifically happened to me and to my neighbors and to many others in district two. You ask for one answer, and then you're sent to another department, another department. Our office would have to be focused on the solution to make sure that neighbors can get involved and do more. Thank you. Thank you. And I um, jumped over Carl. I'm sorry, you were, you were, you were next. Not a problem. Um, I'm going to repeat community dashboard. If we know in a particular zip code or neighborhood or street, if there is a hot spot of crime, you're gonna see it on the hot spot. So part, part of that community dashboard allows for us to, to look at the crime and know if we have an issue in a particular area. Secondly, part of my MLK uh, project is reflectors and reflective paint. So in other words, uh, if you do not currently have your street number on your curbside, I'm gonna get that fixed within three to six months of 3,000 homes, within three to six months. Granted, that is not a lot, but it is a start. Uh, in our first three to six months, we will have uh, curbside uh, reflective paint numbers on at least 3,000 homes. And then secondly, if you have any issues, uh, we're gonna be able to identify your home as long as we know where you're located and we can't communicate with you. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Dory Brown. Okay, well, we know that there's no quick fix to this. And one thing we have to look at is why the people commit creating the crime or created or generalized. And one of them may feel like their hands are tied. So we have to be able to, you know, connect with employers who give um, people a second chance in employment because a lot of times they're doing stuff because they need money and finances. And so we want to make sure we can connect with all the employers who are willing to give those people a second chance. We also may need to have evening programs. I know this was brought up years, years ago by having an evening program where there was sports and stuff um, Friday and Saturday night so that those individuals will have something to do and they're not just wandering around the street board creating problems. Um, if we need to do like a skate park, we have um, like the Second Baptist Church who has a gym and who has a bowling alley, you know, right there in that community, if we can work out some kind of partnership with them, where that can be open in the evening okay. to allow um, individuals to come and have something to do while may, you know, being constructive and, and positive. Um, okay, and the next person on this is Walter Perry Sr. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. I think the key is to empower the community. Uh, I would like to bring back citizens on patrol. That's going to be one of the first things I'm going to uh, invest in. Also, I want to support community leaders that are in on the ground doing the work. We have a lot of formerly incarcerated people like myself and other people out there like Benny Price. He has a movement going on. There's so many people doing so many things. And so we have to support these people when they're doing good things. We're so quick to condemn them when they're acting bad or, or, or you know, when they're going against the city. It's time to embrace the community leaders that are already doing it. So one of the things I propose to a lot of these people and former gang members is a citywide truce. And that's something that we can just present to the city and present to the people and say, look, we care. We're tired of the killing. We want to do it at least starting on Sunday because to a lot of people, that's the Lord's Day. So we want to start on Sunday and hopefully that can go on to other days. So though, that's what I'm going to implement the first 90 days. You can quote me on that and you can come back in 90 days and then you'll see. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on this is Jada Andrews Sullivan. So the first thing that we want to do is continue to make sure that our community feels safe enough to speak out. We want to make sure that their voices are continuously heard. We want to continue to work with our police department by implementing a strategic um, area of making sure that the visually and the visibility of our police officers within our district do not see a sign of being over police. But we also want to make sure that we work with the detectives. The detectives need to have some form of sensibility training to meet and work with these families, but also getting our schools to have the kids speak out. We know that we've seen an escalation and retaliation of crimes and also in domestic violence within our district. So we want to make sure that we have a safe passageway for our community to speak up and speak out. And then we want to make sure that we continue to have the access of our police chief to meet with our faith based community outreach uh, ministries and making sure that we're working with Cops Metro, making sure we're working with the ICANN uh, part of Cops Metro to fully put resources here in the district. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Nika Cleaver. All right. So prevention, options, resources, work. Wait, wait a minute. That's not Nika. Did I, did, did I screw? I, excuse me. Let me. Um, it, that was my bad. And it was absolutely Adam's correct. <laughs> the next person on this was Jalen McKee Rodriguez. I apologize, Jalen. For sure. So I'll start by saying that we need increased street lighting, and it's known that that alone could reduce violent crime by roughly 36% as studied by urban labs. I will, one, propose a street lighting index that overlays hotspots of crime, houselessness, schools, and street lights as a way to identify where the street lighting focus should be. Two, one of the biggest issues we have is that we do not have experts answering the questions about gang affiliation about the root causes of crime and the city's role in policy, budgeting, and infrastructure that's going to address crime. Not a single criminologist is employed by the city, and these are people who understand the root causes of crime and recidivism and how they can be solved in specific communities backed by data. I am proposing a Department of Crime Prevention and Criminology that will make those recommendations and have funding behind them and take some of that burden off of SAPD, because right now SAPD is trying to prevent and address crime but there's been an increase, so that is obviously not working. And from there, we will see the development of a comprehensive data-focused plan to address crime. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Nika Cleaver, it is your turn. So Charlotte, I'm gonna take 10 seconds of my time to say, you better listen to Adam. <laughs> okay, so yes, prevention, options, uh, resources, and working together is what we need to do. We're talking about 90 days. So there's going to be new things that come into place that we'll be able to implement. But let's start with what we already have in our district, in our city. The sheriff's office, the constable's office, and our police have programs to help implement the community so we can have more community policing and individuals who are involved in keeping our, our district safe. We also need programs for our youth to make sure they have options because the lack of options is what often leads people to crime. We need to get into our jails, make sure people who are getting out in, the, in a year have options so they don't have to revert back to what they think they need to do. And again, we'll provide resources by working with all of our partnerships that we have throughout the city so people know they can speak, speak out, and they have the resources to be able to do something different. Thank you. The next person on this question, um, and I am trying to listen to Adam, um, is, is ah, my tabs are all screwed up here, is Pharaoh Clark. 
Thank you. This is an area that's very important to me. And I'm very firm and solid on what I believe is the key. And there's three things. One is investment in our youth. Uh, all the studies show that investment in our youth and also investment in economic development is what's going to start to lower our crime rate. Number two, like I already do, you work with organizations that are uh, moving and that are working with formerly incarcerated people and educating them to become civically engaged. The third thing that you want to do is you want to work with community leaders like uh, Walter Perry said, leaders like Benny Price, uh, groups like Power, Big Mama's House, and, uh, and Bishop Rose's move to, for her STOP campaign that's aimed at stopping violence. But until you invest in the community, you will not see a change in the crime rate. I don't believe that policing, I don't believe that lights are going to stop the crime rate. And if you've lived in District 2, then you already know that. Mute button. Um, thank you. You guys are all a bunch of um, terrific wonks. Um, and I'm going to uh, ask you a question. Usually we, we do it at least three different live streams of candidate forums from uh, District 2 every year. This year we're only doing one. So I'm going to pull up the question that, that is always asked in the Mankey Park um, uh, District 2 candidate forum since they're piggybacking on this forum uh, today. And that question is, what is the most recent book you have read? Okay. Um, and I'm going to go to Jada Andrew Sullivan first. <laughs> um, there, oh, I'm so, sorry. Thank you um, so much. Uh, uh, let me stop you for two seconds. This is going to be 30 seconds. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Start over. Okay, thank you so much. So the most recent book I have read will have to be my Bible. Um, it is a morning meditational devotional for me. Um, it helps me and guides me and leads me on this path to do the work of the will of the people according to what God's will and way is for me. And so that is the most recent book that um, I have actually read. And that was just this morning. So thank you so much. And the next person on this is Dory Brown. Um, well, I do do a daily read of the Bible, but really specifically the book is called 12 Ordinary Men. And it's about the 12 disciples and how God took those 12 ordinary men who had no um, education or whatever. Um, there was nothing extra special about them. And he used them um, for his ministry and to change the world, basically. He used their flaws as um, as their best assets. Thank you. Um, the next person on this question is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. Uh, the most recent book that I read, which I just finished probably two weeks ago, was uh, Fool's Aaron by Lonnie G. Bunch III. So, that was a very good, I would recommend it to anyone. And it wasn't specifically, I didn't read it specifically because of the title or it was because of him. He's inspired me quite a bit. So that's why I took the time to read that book and I recommend it to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person is Chris Dawkins. You're muted. Chris. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I had to unmute myself. Okay. No problem. Um, what would the Rockefellers do uh, is the last book that I read. And that's a book about insurance. Actually, it's uh, a book about whole life insurance. And that was the last book I read. I think it's a very good book. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that others read it unless you're interested in investment and in uh, insurance. Thank you. Um, the next person on this question is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. So I am a grad student about to finish uh, school this, this uh, summer. Um, and so the most recent book that I finished was The Art of Coaching 2.0. Um, and the focus was on effective leadership in organizational structures and how to develop leaders around you. But I am currently reading Cheryl Scully's Greedy Bastards, and it is pretty juicy. So I would do recommend it so far. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the next person on this question, 
um, we're doing a sw switch up here is uh, Carl Booker. Part of my daily routine is definitely to read the Bible, but uh, outside of the Bible, um, I am reading Bayard Martin, and it is about uh, Bayard Rustin, who is a, was a gay black man that helped Martin Luther King with the civil rights movements and some of his uh, perspective. Um, if you get a chance, definitely read it. Uh, he is a true civil rights leader. And uh, it was someone that I did not know existed until I guess a couple of years ago. So Bayard Martin. Thank you. And the next person is Farrell Clark. So uh, currently I'm reading a book called Across That Bridge and it's a vision for a change in the future of America. It's by John Lewis, um, a legend in the civil rights um, community, and that's something that I, I pride myself on is civil rights, uh, the struggle and the fight that continues. So I like to study the, the greats that have come before and see what their mind is. And it just draws from his experience and kind of talks about how to move through that struggle. So for people that are interested in civil rights, it's a really good read um, by a really great man. I think everybody should read it. Thank you. The next person is Walter Perry. Uh, the last book I read was Facebook. Um, it has <laughs> incredible chapters. They talk about any and everything up in there. You have a different story every day. Uh, it's just a wonderful book. Now, but seriously, uh, the last book I read, uh, it's a book about the law of attraction. It's by Charles Hayden. It's called The Master Key System. That's a book that I read all the time. Uh, anytime that I want to draw something near to me, like the council seat, I just think and put myself in that seat. So. Thank you. Um, uh, Norris Tyrone Darden. Yes, ma'am. So just by happenstance, the last book I was reading is called Volume One of the Milk Carton Chronicles. And what it is, it, it kind of uh, parallels biblical relationships with real relationships. And it just so happens I wrote the book. I think you win. Um, uh, the next person is uh, Mika Cleaver. I love it. So I'm such a, like a help get, you know, make yourself a better person. So here you go. We've got 13 ways uh, to uh, 13 things that mentally strong people don't do. Secrets of a great leader right here. Purpose driven life. Okay. That one's right there. And again, the Holy Bible. Now, during campaign time, when have we had time to read any of this? None. So the last thing that I actually got to read was The Secrets of a Great Leader. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is this is this is great. I'm 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 writing all of this down. You know, Nowcast's offices are in when before COVID are in uh, the central library. So um, I have access to all of these. So um Okay, we're going to go back to um, a heavy, heavy duty question here. Um, and, and that is, and back to a one minute answer. What is your position on police accountability and the police contract? And um, uh, you can take it also to the ballot provision if you like. And the person, first person to answer on this is going to be Dory Brown. Um, well, if you're working for me, you're accountable to me. You know? And that's how I look at the police department. I do believe that we need to have a working relationship, you know, and we're going to have to agree to disagree. But um, because you provide a particular service does not mean that you should not be held accountable in the ways to the people that you are serving. Um, so there does need to be some changing. There does need to be some retraining. Um, I've gone to the Citizens Police Academy and see all the things that they're taught. Um, do that 13 week program. But one of the things that we need to know, um, they need some diversity training. I feel that you can't have people policing you that don't know you. Don't take the time to get to know you. You're not gonna learn about other cultures, diversity just by watching TV. So you can't have somebody who's lived a whole segregated life in college and um, elementary and then expect them to go out and police people they know nothing about in reality. Thank you. And that is time. Um, the next person on this is Christy Villanueva. Okay, thank you. I 
strongly support the need for accountability. I have spent a lot of time both in the in ride-alongs and with leadership from the police department here in San Antonio and the police department in Corpus Christi, in addition to the sheriff's department through training and other things that I've done. Accountability is top of the list. We have to have it. You have to make sure that these folks are accountable locally and we need to figure out what we're going to do so they don't move to the next city or the next suburb and do the same thing to other people. Related to the referendum, you know, this is a difficult one because I feel that the language of the current contract needs to be changed. It is needed to be changed for a while, but to support this particular referendum, I'm sorry, I cannot, uh, I will not be in favor of it. I think there are more things that we can do, more effective and immediate things that we can impact for our community. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person on this is Jalen McKee Rodriguez. Yes, so I will say I'm supportive of Proposition B, um, and I support meet and confer for negotiations and efforts to increase accountability and ensure that fired police officers stayed fired. Um, there's a contentious police community relationship that needs mending, and we want to see that. But there's no way that that, that mending this relationship can be done with closed door meetings. I also believe there's six provisions that I would like to see eliminated including delayed interviews with officers under investigation, um, providing evidence to officers under investigation before their interview, um, li limited consideration of, of officers' disciplinary history, um, and I'm, oh, yep, good time. Uh, limited statute of limitation for officers, limited civilian oversight, and providing arbitration against disciplinary action. Um, I also believe the Evergreen Clause was a huge mistake. San Antonio council members can meet the union halfway in good faith, but the union can decide to say no to whatever changes and keep their contract for eight more years so they can just wait it out for new council members. This clause needs to be eliminated. It is not good business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person on this question is Norris Tyrone Darden. So I believe accountability is linked to access. If we don't have access to our leaders, if we don't have access to our unions, there's really no way to hold them accountable. So the first step, I believe, is transparency and openness in these processes, in these in these collective bargaining agreements in regards to contracts and things like that. So that's that's number one. Let me say this as well. I'm 100 percent for accountability as an educator dealing with children all day. We have to be accountable because we're their models. Beyond that, with these contracts, we have to make sure that the people's best interests are involved in making these decisions. And so when the people lose, we all lose. I commend Fix SAPD because they took the democratic process and used it to their advantage. And I look forward to hearing the debate between Fix, a Fix SAPD and Tapoa so we can get a clear understanding of what we will or will not be voting for in regards to Prop B. Thank you. And the next person on this question is Walter Perry. I don't know if Mr. Darton know, but they had that debate yesterday. So you're kind of late. But anyway, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it is funny. I'm in total support of Prop B um, and Prop A because I talked to my community. I went back and forth. I talked to uh, Sapoa. I talked to the firefighters. And I let them know that I'm on their side. But at the same time, it's all about the voters. And talking to my voters and talking to my constituents, most of them feel that I should uh, side with Prop A. And so that's the, that's why I'm going. And that's what you need in a leader. Somebody who's gonna come to the constituents and say, hey, I was thinking about vote no, but why should I vote yes? And then they gave me the reasons. Because originally I was gonna go no, but then after talking to my community, I'm voting all the way yes. So I let Fix SAPD know, I let support know, and I let everyone else know where I stood at the beginning. And this is how I am all the time. I always let you know how I stand at the beginning and I never change course ever. Thank you. Um, the next person on this is Chris Dawkins. Um, I think first of all, uh, there's a lot of misinformation that's going around on both sides. Uh, I do support Proposition B. I think we have an incredible opportunity to have SAPOA to talk with us. And I think that's what the community is asking for. We want them to talk to us. And once they talk to you, I think you will have a better police force for Proposition B 
because you will have both sides hopefully talking to each other. If Sapoa decides to really be very strict and not want to talk to the people, then it's going to be very, very difficult. But I believe we have a, a unique opportunity here so that they can hear what it, what it is that we're asking. Sapoa has been the only force that has not had a community involvement. Thank you. Next question. Uh, next person is Nika Cleaver. So we're talking accountability. Uh, accountability is an absolute must, not just for our police to be accountable, but everybody who does anything for something in our city needs to be accountable. So the police are absolutely no different. I think the problem that we have is the fact that we don't see any discipline. Right. So I want to put the word discipline out there when something happens and someone has broken the law. If we see the discipline, then we'll feel a lot better about what's going on. Do I feel like taking away 174 is going to hold accountability within the law force? I do not see that as of yet. I'm going to have to do more research on that. What I'm worried about is being a being a leader in District 2 and not having proper communication with our police force and not having the proper uh, relationship that moves the district forward and keeps safety in our district, keeps cops, gives up the opportunity to hire more cops and hire educated cops that have experience and and are educated within uh, within college education, right? So this is the things that I that concern me the most. Accountability is a must. And the next person on this is Jada Andrew Sullivan. Thank you so much. So we have to start holding those that are going to say that they take an oath to protect and serve our community accountable for doing just that, protecting and serving and not over policing or threatening the lives of the people that they're here to serve. So that is first and foremost. Also, when you speak about Proposition B and you speak about the repeal of 174, you have to know all of the facts. And that's what happened on yesterday. What we found out is that even repealing 174 will not handle the disciplinary actions that come along with what we're looking for. We have to continue to push our state legislative agenda, which makes sure that accountability is at the forefront of the changes that we want to see. We also have to look at the changes within the 180 days of ruling and making sure that we do not keep that 180 days on the books. But we have to make sure that if you are going to wear the badge, you are here to do the job of protecting and serving what you have taken an oath to do. And that's how we have to get to the first steps of accountability. Thank you. And thank you. And the next person is Farrell Clark. Okay, first and foremost, I am definitely in support of Proposition B. I think I've been one of the most vocal supporters of Proposition B, and I've fought at every single level to push uh, not only this type of reform, but other reforms forward. Um, I think that it's important to understand that Proposition B is not putting anybody against the police department. I think I speak uh, for all of us here that we have a respect for the deep uh, the job that our police department does for our city. But at the same time, we need to have accountability and be able to hold bad officers accountable. While we know that the repeal of 174 isn't the only step that needs to be taken in order for us to achieve that goal, it is definitely a first step. If, if negotiating at the contract table would be effective, then we already would have had this measure in place because let's not forget, this is not the first time the city has tried to fight for accountability within our police department and they have been blocked at every step of the way. We must act now if we wanna ensure the safety of our community. Thank you. Um, quick, quick note here, um, I should have, um, uh, <clears throat> I should have uh, uh, called um, Mr. Perry out on making a personal comment to another member here. And um, please, going forward. No, he made it to me first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should. I should have. I should have like stopped it in its tracks. And I. And I. I apologize for not stopping it in its tracks. But please, um, let's squish it right now, um, and um, and go forward with aiming our um, comments at the policies, not the people. Um, we are coming up on, uh, we're, we're running a little bit over time and um, to my wonderful friends at SAI, I, I apologize because we're gonna go over, because um, um, I'm coming up on another 10 minute section um, here and that is people's closing 
um, uh, because I, I think um, in many instances, y'all had um, uh, things that were left uh, that you wanted to follow up on and things that you may, may have wanted to clarify. And so I wanna give each of you one minute to close out and we're gonna do that in ballot order, um, uh, starting if you are ready. Uh, one minute and starting with Ms. Nika Cleaver. Look, I gotta wait till I see my cute face on the screen. <laughs> there we go. Just like she said, number one on the ballot and working very hard to be number one in your heart. Um, I've been in this district, I've been in San Antonio all my life. I've lived in district two for 10 years on purpose to give, to provide resources, to provide a, a platform for our people. I have the passion, I have the energy, I have the knowledge, I have the proven track record. I've got things done in this city. I've got things done in this district. The, the community loves to work with me and we can continue to move things forward. Again, I ask humbly for your vote, your support and get ready because when I do get elected May 1st, we will be, we're going to go straight to work. We're going to get our boards and commissions filled with the proper people and the proper um, the folks that love our districts. And we're going to get our projects and our programs working and going. So just be excited because I'm excited. And I thank everybody for all the support I've already gotten and for all the votes on May 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Carl. Did I miss you on that last question? Yes, you did. I, I'm terribly sorry. It's all right. Things happen. I'm terribly sorry. Okay. Um, uh, let's have you go to the last question, which was, um, what is your position on police accountability in the police contract? Okay. Uh, I am in uh, agreement with Prop B. Um, I think for the first time, fixed SAPD was on the offense. We can look at what happened in Georgia, um, uh, with what they just recently passed. They're on the offense. A lot of times for um, uh, minority communities, we're on the defense. George Floyd gets killed. Trayvon Martin gets killed. So now we're on the defense. We have to, we have to respond. How do we respond? This is the kind of thing what police accountability does. Uh, we, we hold them accountable. What are their intents? Are their intents to do harm? Is their intent to intimidate us? I don't want that to be the case. I, I don't want them to have uh, qualified immunity, meaning that they, can, they are qualified to kill us. Secondly, I don't want them to have a new technology, maybe a thing called medical handcuffs. It allows them to inject a, a bad actor. In some cases, it kills them. The intent is there, and it needs to be stopped. Thank you. Um, okay, and we are going to go back to closings. Um, like, is it my turn again? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that I was the I was the victim of a typo. So um, um, it was uh, anyway. We're going to uh, go back to. Um, ballot order for closing statements. So um, the next person would be Walter Perry. Hi, uh, I'm Walter Perry and I'm humbly asking for your vote. Um, the reason why I'm running for District 2 is because I want to take it in the business direction. I hear a lot of people saying that they've done things, they got things accomplished, but if you go right on Gevers, there are, new, there are sidewalks that got established about four years ago. I have a proven track record of getting things done. I used to work for Sage for two years. I have economic development experience, so I have experience with working with developers. I don't think any of these candidates can say that. I also have experience through uh, my college, Texas A&M University, with working with groundbreaking initiatives that we're working on right now through Henry Cisneros. I don't think any of the candidates can say that. I own my, home, my own home. I, I reinvested into my community. I have an award-winning program called Suit Up, which Nika, actually, I got the first award through her radio station. So my work has been impeccable for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I hear people saying they got things done, but you can go see the work that I've, I've done. You can go look at my name at St. Phillips College and see my name everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person um, is Jada Andrews Sullivan. First, thank you so much to NowCast. Thank you to our community. Thank you to the District of Residents who have submitted your questions. 
We are here for you. We are here to make the difference and we are here to be the change that we want to see. As we continue to go forward, we go forward in understanding that District 2 will be the shining light of the city of San Antonio. We have seen what happens when we move in consistency together. We've seen the changes that we make together and we see how we build a consensus of understanding with what it looks like to move District 2 forward. We look forward to continuing to serve you in District 2. We look forward to continuing the momentum that we have built within our city, within our city council, and within our city staff. As we go forward, we go forward in unity. For we know that when we continue to educate, empower, and uplift our district, that's when we see the change that we want. And together, we make the difference. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And the next person is Farrell Clark. Thank you. Uh, my name is Farrell Clark, and I humbly ask for your vote for City Council Representative District 2. The reason is this. I believe that everybody running has a good heart. I believe we're all good people. But the difference that I believe in myself is that I have a track record of getting things done, the results that you have asked for, not only on a city level, a county level, but also a state level. I have gone and I have spent countless hours and countless amounts of energy to advocate for you on your behalf, and I will continue to do that. I don't believe the city council seat is something that's part-time. It should be full-time representation, and that's what I'm guaranteeing to bring to you. Action, accessibility, and accountability. These are the reasons that I humbly ask for your vote for your District 2 candidate, and I promise that I will bring the same amount of energy that I fight with right now to the district full-time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next person up is Christy Villanueva. Thank you. I am Christy Villanueva, and I am number five on the ballot. So I'm going to humbly ask for your support to carry me through to this seat as city council person. And I understand as a resident, as I live here in the district full time, I'm also here to serve you. I go through many of the same things that you go through on a daily basis. And I want to help bring strong leadership, communication, and unity back into District 2 to represent all individuals, regardless of who you are. That's what I can bring to the table. Let me do that for you. Come and join me, and you can reach me at any time. I will always make myself available to you. Thank you. I am Christy Villanueva, and you'll see me as number five on the ballot. Thanks. Thank you. And next is Norris Tyrone Darden. Yes, ma'am. I want to close by saying this. Uh, thank now. I thank Nowcast for this opportunity to showcase uh, all of the District 2 candidates who are willing to, and prepared to come on. Uh, thank you. And the reason why I say that is this. District 2 needs to be informed. They need to have the information and they need to turn out and vote. Because if we don't and we continue to have poor civic engagement, our district is going to continue not to have the funds that we need to move forward. So again, I encourage everyone that is here looking and viewing this to share it and tell people about it because they need to know there are 12 total candidates and most of those candidates are here and they shared their vision, they shared their, their systems and processes that they will go through and they shared their views on different things. And so again, I wanna thank Nowcast for this opportunity that not for me or the candidates, but for the community to see what every candidate has to offer and bring to the table. Thank you again. Thank you. The next person is Chris Dawkins. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank Nowcast as well and uh, echo what uh, Tyrone just said. Uh, for those who don't know or come in late, I am Chris Dawkins. I'm the candidate for San Antonio's City Council District 2 race. And you'll be glad to know that help is on the way. Senior citizens, you not, have not had anyone to represent you uh, at the local level. Uh, so I'm counting on you to elect me because help is on the way. Voters are going to create stronger neighborhoods. We're going to create those stronger neighborhoods by neighbors working together, which is the first step in reducing crime in your neighborhood. So in that regard, help is on the way. Um, that's why the city uh has they're not doing anything to help our our um high schools but i will 
The mantra that I preach is that in District 2, we will do for ourselves what others ask the city to do for them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Dory Brown. Dory, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm Dory Brown, and I humbly ask for your vote. I know I'm number nine on the ballot, but if you go down to number nine and pick me, you'll be making the right choice there. Um, I want you to know I'm a person with compassion, open-mindedness. I think outside the box. I'm willing to work hard for you and with others, and I'll fight like hell when absolutely necessary. Um, I come to this, this um, position boldly. First, accountable to God, and then accountable to those that have voted for me and those that I represent, whether you voted for me or not. I'm willing to address the concerns of the residents. The residents make up the number one reason why we should be in this seat. Um, our This district is comprised of different areas, and all those different residents have different concerns. And may, even though it may not be a priority to you, it should be a priority. Or, to you, it should be a priority to them. And um, I just want to say, Hi. please keep in mind, a church in our district and a seminary just burnt down last night at Huntley Park Baptist Church on Houston Street. So let's please keep them in our prayers. Thank you. Uh, next is Carl Booker. Yes, uh, my name is Carl Booker. Again, this word keeps being repeated, but track record. My track record is, is a national award-winning product that I produce on a weekly basis. I believe in investing in people, and I have done that. Um, it's been well-documented for the last 10 years. I believe investing in people. I also believe in establishing standards. Once we establish those standards, we get to determine where we are as a community. In establishing those standards, we need to establish milestones. You know, what, what does success look like for us, or what, what do failures look like? And then also a timeline, how do we reach those timelines for measurable growth? One of the things that are important when you think about artificial intelligence and how we consider them to be experts, they must fail 100,000 times to be considered an expert. I have no intentions on failing 100,000 times, but I do believe I have failed enough to know what not to do. You can't beat experience and you can't pay for it. You must do it and you must live by it. Thank you for this opportunity and vote for Carl Book for D2. Thank you. And Jalen McKee Rodriguez. Yes, so thank you all who are watching. I wanna reemphasize to you, I'm running because we are a city of working class people and we deserve working class representation. We have too many lawyers, consultants, and wealthy people as elected officials. We have too many people who have been allowed to exploit our communities for profit. And we do not have enough teachers, nurses, caseworkers, and regular people who feel the impact of the decisions they make on the diets. I'm running because to this day, I am not represented by our government on a number of levels. Every, gener every generation is represented on the diets except for mine, and young people make up a third of the city. And I'm running because we need real progressive leadership in office, not scripted words and people promising to be a voice. We need a leader who will be some ears that will listen. It begins and ends with open ears. I have committed and have a track record, as everyone is saying, to being that leader. Find me last, but not least, on the ballot. <laughs> Hope y'all like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all, and and thank you um, for for sticking with us. To my wonderful friends at SAI um, uh, interpreters, you have been you have been more than gracious about all of this. Um, to everyone involved, um, I, you should know that um, Nowcast will have up um, probably by Monday um, our usual annual special section called, and it will be called Nowcast SA. It will be tagged in the um, uh, homepage on the on the menu bar and it will say election uh, 2021 and it will have all of the videos not just this one but all of the videos some that you guys were referring to um tier one has been doing a, an, an incredible job the west side neighbors have been doing an incredible job you guys know more than anyone that there have been a ton of um candidate forums and we have and pride ourselves on putting up everyone's candidate forums, not just ours. So you you will be able to point people to that page, and please also point people to um, our our um, homepage for 
the early voting map, we have um, always put up a, an early voting and, and then polling places map. And now that you can vote any place during election day, we also have, have that up on election day. And it's uh, a short, shortened URL, bit.ly slash SA votes. Um, that has been used, well, this is a little out of date, by more than 185,000 people to find the closest place to vote. And I'm taking credit for getting all of them out to vote. But getting out to vote is the most important thing that we can do. Um, and that, yeah, that yeah. form of civic engagement is is important to lengthening your life. I mean, it keeps you, it will make you live longer. So stay civically engaged, get out to vote. And again, thank you so very, very much to our friends at SEI um, Interpreters and to um, Liz and, and Dee uh, and my chairman of the board, Chuck Andrews, um, for supporting um, this work. And to all of you guys, thank you so very much for your most precious resource today your attention and your time. And um, I hope that the residents of District 2, including me, I know I really appreciated it. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, so much. Thank and Ivana, you. you are the Thank best. You. I just want Ivana to know you're the best. And I Cynthia, know. too. Yeah, and Cynthia. Cynthia how could no, she was, no, she was she fingering is. it up. <laughs> but Ivana needs to do all of my uh, stuff for me because she's just as, as candid and everything. So like mm -hmm. together, We'll make people tired. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome.